But as long as they don't touch mad as hell, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> And, well, a busy week, uh, not for Victorians so much, but certainly for our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, seen here in a rare publicity photograph. Not only has he been off testing the integrity of the travel bubble with New Zealand, and it held up very nicely, he electrified the party faithful by taking to the stage on the weekend for the Liberal Party's Federal Council meeting. Nothing unusual there, but it was his introduction by the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, that really caught the edge of my cardigan. Sir Robert Menzies had his forgotten people. John Howard had his battlers. ScoMo has his quiet Australians. The quiet Australians, of course, being the ones who don't make a lot of noise about being stranded overseas or not being vaccinated because they're disabled or in aged care or who protest about climate change or are vocal on women's issues or ask questions at press conferences that haven't been vetted. Basically, the ones who don't have anything to complain about and good on them. And I think more people should shut up about what's bothering them and let the government get on with their job of listening to them. So if you're a quiet Australian, I want you to get up. Get up out of your chair, go to the window, throw it open and yell, I'm a quiet Australian and I'm sorry if this seems out of character. Meanwhile, Labor held its own get-together last week, a closed-door caucus meeting in Canberra, uh, whether that was to keep people in or out, I'm not sure. And it didn't go quite as well as the Liberal one, with one Labor MP reporting to journalists afterwards that everyone is feeling flat and morale is low. A quote like that on the poster is never going to get the crowds in. Bright young Labor thing, crispy star jump. What's the problem? Why is morale so low? Oh... I don't know. Come on, what is it? It's just... We're nowhere. What's the point anymore? Well, come on, don't talk like that. For the ABC's sake. Everyone likes the government more than us. That's not true. It's true. They hate us. No, no one hates you. You haven't done anything to make anyone hate you for ten years. We never win elections. We can't win a by-election. Albo never wins any of the polls. Now, come on. You, you've got to look on the bright side. You guys are completely divided on coal. You should be grateful you're not in government with that sort of disunity stemming from the long-standing cultural rift between your educated progressives and your working-class loyalists in resources and manufacturing. Mm. And with internal reform seemingly beyond the party. And with a chronically unpopular leader. And nowhere to go on economic policy after the budget. And your ideological reluctance to prioritise struggling families over social issues. And your sustained inability to convey to Australians what you actually stand for. Play to your strengths. Opposition is what you're good at. Oh, no, thanks, Sean. That's good of you to say. And with our compliments, please accept a free wheel and political realignment from Scott Morrison's team arts. Cool. Of course, Labor are getting it from all sides at the moment, not just from within the party. The PM, who normally doesn't go in for identity politics, blamed those who identify as being on the left for the slower-than-a-Terence Malick movie vaccine rollout. If those opposite can't bring themselves in a united national effort to fight this vaccine, then I will let the Australian people judge them for that. So that's the problem. The Morrison government's been trying to fight the vaccine. Well, in that case, it's going very well. Under 10% of Australians vaccinated. Few, if any, developed countries in the world can boast they've managed to keep the rates that low. Yet still the battle rages. And not just thanks to Labor. Australia's Chief Medical Officer, Paul Kelly... Actually, why should I tell you what he said when Sky News can do it for me? The Chief Medical Officer confirms vaccine incentives like cash, lotteries or discounts should be on the table to encourage people to get a jab. And fair enough, too. While the lockdown in Victoria has prompted tens of thousands of Australians to go and get vaccinated this last week, it's probably unreasonable to expect them to infect each other and close down their state just so the rest of us can get over our vaccine hesitancy. Mind you, I'm not sure about the CMO suggestions. Should a fiscally conservative government be handing out cash or big lottery payouts like they do in the US? Our Federal Health Minister, the Honourable Greg Hunt, for whom I have the utmost respect, and... Hey! Hey, that's Steve Buscemi. Greg Hunt looks nothing like Steve Buscemi, who is famous for playing degenerate psychopaths in movies. Please. No, actually, change it back. Thank you. Anyway, Greg says we don't need a lottery worth a million dollars to give us a reason to get vaccinated when... The strongest reason is to avoid the lottery of death. 
Now, there's a tagline to an anti-vaccine hesitancy campaign, if ever I've heard one. Let, let's go full screen with that so people can screen grab it and pass it around on social media. Could we? Ah, oh, thank you. That, that should really help get the message out there. In other words, you don't need a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down. Just take the medicine, you big baby. Assuming it's available. Of course, Greg got his second jab on the weekend, which is not only a good example to us, but great that at least he'll be OK in the event that we don't achieve herd immunity. The government, though, continued to insist... It's not a race. And he's right. In a race, you go as fast as you can and uh, train and prepare for it. Although when the PM announced the big push at the end of the year that would see 6 million Australians aged under 50 vaccinated, he said that would be effectively, if we wished, a 12-week sprint. So a sprint that's not a race like the one you have on a sports day at a Steiner school. Either that or the acting Prime Minister is wrong and that the real non-acting Prime Minister suggests it is a race. It's the race that stops a nation from getting vaccinated. Again, we get back to Greg Hunt and the accusation levelled at him by Half Past Seven show host Lee Sales. There were this week 29 aged care facilities in Victoria that had not been vaccinated. Whose head's going to roll for that? And will they roll heads out faster than the vaccine? But I think we need to cut the government a bit of slack. As Labor's head Lemming said... The government had two jobs this year. Yeah, they're in so much debt from the budget that they've had to work two jobs. They must be exhausted. Incidentally, to Victorians in lockdown, with their head in their hands, can I just say, be careful not to touch your face. I know you're suffering at the moment, and I also know that the thoughts and prayers of everybody else around Australia are along the lines of, thank God it's them and not us. Though it's always reassuring to be reminded that hotel quarantine had a 99.99% effective rate, effectiveness rate, Mr Speaker. 99.99%. Let's round it up to 99.999. How does something which is basically perfect, however, keep failing? It's a question I put to a new character we're trying out who represents the Chief Medical Officer. It's a bit of a cliche, isn't it? Shh. Well, look, Sean, just to put the 99.99% effectiveness into some sort of context, mm -hmm. if it were just 100 people coming into Australia, a 0.01% leak would mean, say, one person's severed toe had escaped quarantine with COVID. And that's not probably going to get very far, is it? Exactly. But as soon as you have more than 10,000 people going through quarantine, a 0.01% leak means one whole unit of people is leaking out into the community with COVID. One person. Yes, and all 10 COVID-infected toes. And if you consider the government's rationale for closing borders with India was that quarantine only has capacity to handle a maximum limit of 2% of arrivals being infected, you can't really take credit for the 98% of people who come into quarantine who aren't sick. I reckon I know someone who could. Plus, some people are catching COVID in quarantine, which means that while hotels are somewhat effective as a quarantine, mm -hmm. they are also partially effective at being cesspools. And has the government shown any interest in developing a purpose-built cesspool? Well, they actually built this one some time ago. Um, yeah, you know, right, you're right. This character is a bit obvious, isn't he? Well, I did try and warn you. You did, and you did. And uh, later on in related news with Australia's private health industry in a death spiral and unable to rely on the federal government for help, will private health be prevented from using a public hospital for treatment? Plus, Sunrise viewers turn on desperately homesick Paul Hogan. That is disgusting. He must be desperate if he's turned on by the kind of people who watch Sunrise. And concerns for 89-year-old man who walked out of his aged care facility grow after he walks back into it. Hi there. Are you tired of government praise? Sick of hearing how they save the economy? Here's Labor's Anthony Albanese. In last year's budget, the government announced its signature jobmaker program would support 450,000 jobs. But the program only supported just 1,000 jobs. 1,000 jobs. Former advisor to former finance minister Matthias Cormann and now Matters Hell's new finance commentator Darius Horsham. I'm back. The job maker program. Matthias and Josh said it had produced 450,000 jobs. It's only come up with 1,000. That's quite a discrepancy, isn't it? Not if you allow a margin of error of 449,000. It's an embarrassment, isn't it? How can Matthias look at his new OECD colleagues in the face? He does it mainly by Zoom. A measly 1,000 jobs. You're such a glass-half-empty guy, Sean. It created a 1,000 jobs. Celebrate it. Let off some steam. Half-empty? If it had created 225,000 jobs, I'd say the glass was half-empty. But a 1,000? That's like a bead of condensation in the glass that evaporates before it hits the bottom. Why are you hounding me about this abject policy failure that Matthias was only partly responsible for? He's out of there now and in Paris, hanging around with representatives of OECD member states, where his accent is nothing special and they certainly wouldn't be making sport of it with a 
character like me. You are being an organization for economic cooperation and development, girly man. Well, look, but Why I... don't you interview a parody of Josh Frydenberg? He was the treasurer, after all. Or do bold caps take a long time in the makeup? Darius Horsham there, Mad as Hell's new finance commentator. I am not a commentator. And with devastated Victorian business owners still enduring their fourth lockdown, what better time to release the annual financial review rich list? The mining boom has increased the fortunes of iron ore magnates Gina Reinhardt and Andrew Forrest at the top of the list, while the work from home revolution sped up by COVID has helped Atlassian office cloud software maker Mike Cannon Brooks. So a combined total for those three of $78.49 billion, which is what the federal government just spent in the budget. Uh, not their money, heaven forbid, no, that's Labor policy. Anyway, good on them. Between them, a combined increase in wealth this year of $9.67 billion, which I assume we can put down to JobKeeper. Speaking of which, Darius, a corporate governance advisory firm researching JobKeeper reckons about a quarter of a billion dollars in government support was given to companies that were thriving during the pandemic. Well, it makes more sense than wasting the money by giving it to businesses that were dying in the ass. Why aren't you demanding it be paid back, though? You, you send out robo-debt calls to people on welfare demanding money they didn't even owe. Your point being... I mean, that was essentially a phone scam, wasn't it? And a perfectly successful one, too, if we hadn't had that pinhead Stuart Rabbit running it. So why not some automated calls from a couple of banditos? Or, more frighteningly, Michaelia Cash demanding the money back? Just because someone doesn't need money isn't a reason for the government not to give it to them. Did Malcolm Turnbull need his parliamentary salary? Did the ABC need whatever it spent on your teetotaling, moralising, anti-alcohol industry, my poop doesn't stink documentary snooze fest? Just because some enterprising arses like your Harvey's and the Normans were smart enough to turn a dollar out of the threats to the planet's population, you want to cut them down. You are green left with envy. Anyway, job keepers finished now, so it's back to whatever they call the dole these days. Slob keeper, I guess. Thank you, Darius. Fantastic. Still, you do have to be careful what you say, because defamation has been very popular this year. As you might have heard, the ABC was, until quite recently, being sued for millions of dollars, plus millions more in legal costs. It's a pity we didn't go to judgment, actually, and lose, because it would have been a perfect opportunity for us to ask the government to help us out with an increase in our budget. Incidentally, I, I would like to point out that uh, in the 10 years that we've been on air, Mad as Hell has never been sued for defamation, which means we're either very clever when writing the show or that no-one important actually watches it. Anyway, there's, uh, there's talk in the media of reforming defamation law to make it easier for the media to make out their defence, and there's also talk of scrapping those reforms to make it easier for the lawyers to make their money. So let's have a look at both sides of the argument in the ABC's traditional binary fashion. Plonk McGrundle, you're a defamation expert. Be very careful. If I were to call a would that be defamatory? Well, were you to preface your statement with, in my opinion, is a then I think you might be OK. I mean, is not an allegation of anything specific, so I wouldn't have thought it was actionable. Were you to say, to use another example, that Anthony Albanese is a and that he I think you might be in trouble. Mm. So is OK? They'd probably bleep you, but that's more ABC editorial policy than defamation law. Well, they can be very sensitive about language, depending on what mood they're in. They are a bunch of... If I were to say it's alleged that... ...allegedly... ...in an alleged... ...and allegedly in response to the alleged allegations... ...would there be a problem with that? I think it is possible to overuse the word alleged. Right. Frankly, when something is before the courts, or looks like it might be before the courts, or is being investigated by the police, or two police forces, full stop, or there's an internal investigation, whether it's paused or not, and regardless of whether the findings are ever made public, and people in glass houses, etc., etc., it's safer for the media not to allude to it in any way, no matter what the case is about. Like in the trial against Cardinal... Exactly. Or the one against Bernard Kalari and uh, Witness K. Of course, it's a lot easier to not report what's going on in a trial if the then Attorney General has made it a secret one. Perhaps he should have done that in his own case before he handballed the Attorney General portfolio to Michaelia Cash. And finally, can we talk generally about censorship at the ABC? Sure. Yeah. I don't want to wind a segment up now. Oh, OK, right. Uh, well, uh, Plonk McGrundle, it's been a pleasure. Sunday night on Vera, there's foul play afoot. No water in the lungs, so dead before he hit the water. Unless someone removed his lungs and swapped them for someone else's. 
Yes, well, the PM will tell us more. Oh, you're saying Boris Johnson's involved. <laughs> and as the net closes in, some of the locals are getting nervous. Scott, come back! No! Why not? You catch me! I think I could do that, did you, Pat? Hmm. Vera, Sunday, 8.30, followed by the Mrs Beyoncé Mysteries. And by the way, uh, this week's competition is who should be more embarrassed by this photograph? Send your entries to us at this address and you will receive your letter back due to insufficient postage. And just on Craig Kelly, uh, he'll be running as an independent at the next election. And uh, whilst he's popular, certainly with Sky News, and outspoken, again, mainly on Sky News, he can be a bit extreme and out there. He needs an ally to temper and soften that renegade style, someone rational and measured. So he's teamed up with Clive Palmer, who's agreed to bankrupt Kelly's campaign. So we have Clive Palmer from the Palmer United Party financially backing an independent who could be running against his own party. That's like Malcolm Turnbull. Well, it's, it's like Malcolm Turnbull. Like a solar eclipse that uh, could cause you serious harm if you look directly at it, it's time to cast our eyes over the headlines of the Daily Telegraph through the smoke glass of a segment called... Well, pun sub-editor Chris Lorax joins us as usual. And Chris, I understand times are tough at News Corps this year and uh, you've been working from home as an unpaid intern. Uh, yes, uh, although I've recently been promoted to editor-in-chief of the entire newspaper shop. Well done. Yeah, yeah they, they, they're still working from home with no change in pay. Well, they, they got their money's worth with this first one. Slogan is lickety-split. Yeah, so that's about uh, KFC getting rid of its finger-licking good slogan because of COVID. Yeah. No pun intended. None taken. Yeah, so uh, the slogan is lickety-split. Meaning it's fast. No, no, it's, it's gone lickety-split. Well, you don't say gone in the headline. You say split. Yeah, why? Sounds like spit. There's a lick there. Doesn't make any sense, though, does it? Just a bit of fun. Now, while this one makes grammatical sense... No, I knew you'd love this one. <laughs> uh, crackdown on athletes in Tokino. Yeah, right, because they can't socialise because of COVID and it's in Tokyo where the Olympic Games are. You know, in, in Japan. So, so we put an N in there to make it no. See? Tokino. Mm. And when you said I'd love this one, you were... Lying... Hadley says, tuna in to my show. Yeah, so uh, Ray Hadley is a radio... No, I get the tuna in bit. Yeah, and he's holding a fish, see in the picture there? I understand that. Yeah, and he's at the fish markets and he's saying, tuna in to my show, because <laughs> the market is full of wogs. Yeah, I understand the joke, such that it is. It's the quotation marks around tuna in. Did Ray Hadley actually say those words? No, he didn't. So in what way is it a quote? Well, uh... I said it to the copy editor so she could type it in. So frockin' good to see. Yeah, cos there's ladies in frocks. And you'll be pleased to see we've used the correct punctuation there uh, with an apostrophe where the G would have been. Frocking up is the expression, though, isn't it? Yeah, but we've made it sound like we're saying fucking. It's a, it's a pun, yeah. On fuck. It's not clever to swear. I know, that's why we wrote frockin', you asshole. Well, we make jokes here on Mad as Hell about our representative democracy and the politicians who make a mockery of it, but uh, when you look at how elected officials conduct themselves in other countries, you realise how lucky we are that our MPs don't physically attack each other or throw chairs at each other or dump each other into skips or knock everybody else out because someone doesn't like the election result. Of course, it is possible to take it too far the other way. I think we got the balance just right over here. A system where our politicians get to stand up and say what needs to be said. The oh, member for Lord, Lily Lord, will resume her seat. Oh. Treasurer will resume his seat. The Leader of the House will resume his seat. Your the words. member for Duncan will resume trusted. his seat. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Well, at least everyone respects the Speaker's call. The Minister for Health will resume his seat. Minister for Health will resume his seat. I've now asked the Minister for Health to resume his seat for the third time. 
The Minister for Health can resume his seat full stop. I'm not going to be ignored. Or at least the Speaker respects everyone else. The Speaker. Prime Brad Minister will resume his screaming. seat. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. Well, well, I'm going to say to the Prime the Minister, cabinet. he can pause. He had done that and he'd moved on. And I'm asking you to return to the question. Happy to do that, Mr Speaker. So I don't half. care whether you're happy or not. Okay. You need to return to the question. Half. I mean, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall when those two passed each other in the corridor afterwards. I asked our costume department to see what they could do, but, uh, you know, it wasn't very convincing. And the uh, same with the makeup. Not quite right. Instead, I decided to speak to a real fly who happened to be on the wall in the corridor at the time. Good evening, sir. What a pleasure it is to be here. What happened uh, when the Speaker and the PM ran into each other? Tell us everything. Well, sure, the Prime Minister was his usual self, posing for publicity photos and barely making sense when he spoke, and the Speaker, very graciously, didn't even mention the incident, held down as he was on the ground by Peter Dutton, who was waterboarding him. So, uh, so things were civil? Hard to tell, Sean. Drawn as I am to bullshit, my attention was diverted by Greg Hunt, who was out giving a press conference in the courtyard, and I had to fly away and lay some eggs in it. It's perfectly understandable. Thank you very much indeed, Fly. Thanks, Sean. I do sometimes worry about our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. How does he handle all the pressure of the criticism he gets, not only over the slower-than-promised vaccine rollout and the stranded overseas citizens, but the way he's dealt with a historical sexual assault accusation against one of his ministers, the ongoing sexual assault accusations against a staffer, his tone deafness on women's issues generally, and the trade war we're having with China? Well, certainly not by actually doing anything about them. And while $190,000 in government empathy training might help you pass for a human being when you appear in public, how do you hold it together in your private moments when you look down deep into your soul and find only a post-it note that says not known at this address. Art therapist to the Prime Minister, Donald McEngadine. How does the uh, PM let off steam and not have it go to his head like a kettle and make his nose whistle? Well, obviously, Sean, the relationship between art therapist and customer is a sacred trust and I would never betray a confidence unless it was to my tactical advantage to leak it or angrily blurt it out at a press conference to avoid answering a question. And the Prime Minister is no different. He's no different. But whipping up a birdhouse for the kids in your downtime and uh, posting photos of it online is a great way to distract you. Well, that's fantastic. A trip down to Bunnings in the com car, a few sheets of untreated chipboard, some, some galvanised finishing nails, sprog of wood glue, a drill with a force and a bit, and, hey, presto, an electorate predisposed to not voting against you that much. Yeah, but what about the affairs of state, you know, the things that actually matter when you're running a country? <sighs> Obviously, Sean, a Facebook post about a birdhouse is no substitute for good and effective governance. Mm -hmm. That calls for something more nuanced, like this children's nursery cuckoo clock. Amazon order, comes in kit form, lick a paint, iPhone camera, nails in your mouth, click, text it off to your media advisor and sit back and check on the likes every 45 seconds. Well, I understand that public image is important, uh, no matter how fabricated it might be, but when action is called for on a federal level, when something needs to be urgently accomplished and the people are craving leadership... You build a homemade pigsty for the kids. Some 4B2s, bit of bailing wire, a bunch of straw, and you'll blow even the most pressing issue off what's trending on Twitter for sometimes up to a whole hour. Well, Donald McGangadine there, uh, Scott Morrison's art therapist. And you can name your pigs after your vanquished political opponents. Well, coming up... Australians have a lot of questions about the COVID-19 vaccine. Questions like, where should I get vaccinated? Who is eligible? When will it be available? Which vaccine is right for you? Are certain people at higher risk? Should I wait for other vaccines to arrive? Why are there so many unanswered questions? Will I be able to travel if I'm not vaccinated? Can I get vaccinated early? What is an mRNA vaccine? How can I keep informed about the rollout? These are good questions. And, uh, and before we uh, go on, just a brief update on the uh, Australia post Cartier watch debacle, or as we're calling it, Holgate Gate. The parliamentary inquiry into Australia Post has recommended the Prime Minister deliver an apology to former boss Christine Holgate. And how damning that the inquiry recommends the PM deliver it rather than relying on Australia Post.
Well, to breaking news now and the New South Wales mice crisis uh, with an announcement that in order to tackle the plague, the Berejiklian government has secured 5,000 litres of one of the world's strongest mice-killing chemicals, which, according to reports, could be distributed within days. That's if the poison rollout goes to plan, with phase one of the rollout seeing mice aged over 50 in mouse years being eligible. The state agriculture minister said, we're giving our farmers the tools they need to combat these vile vermin. Well, nice alliteration, Septimus Caesar, from the Department of Extermination. You see, here's your problem. Humans aren't psychologically equipped to deal with mice. You've got to get inside their mind. You've got to learn to think like a mouse. Well, last week, the animal rights organisation, Peter, pleaded with farmers not to kill the mice, arguing that they should not be denied their right to food because of the dangerous notion of human supremacy. Is, uh, is the notion of human supremacy uh, dangerous? Well, yes. If you're talking about these whack jobs from Peter being in charge of anything, I mean, what are they proposing? A world run by mice where everyone just sits around eating cheese and defecating wherever they want. I can get that at home with my own children. One interesting development is that the mice are turning to cannibalism in order to survive and that uh, they eat each other's heads off. Yes, well, where's Peter now? Where's their plea to these cannibal mice not to chow down on each other's heads? It's double standards. Uh, should cut their numbers down a bit. Thanks, Septimus. You have to know what they want, need. If you can do that, if you can think like a mouse, anticipate their moves, boom, sayonara mouse. Yes, Septimus Caesar there, live from our regional New South Wales studio. Well, last year, Mad as Help was assisting the arts community with a leg up so they could get out of the hole created by a combination of COVID and the government's policy of pretending those who work in the arts don't exist. One of those legs we've been lending a hand to belongs to the Australian Ballet and principal ballerina Wilma Spade Callender. I just want to thank you, uh, Wilma, and the rest of the Corps de Ballet for appearing on the show and helping us uh, tell the various news stories that affect us all so very muchly. Yeah, no, nah, sure, no worries. Rocking up now and then on the telly, been a doddle. Certainly beats having to drag our asses across the stage every night. Oh, Pavo? No, nah, Swan Lake, usually. OK. And uh, what are you going to dance for us this evening? Well, tonight it's the cautionary tale of Richard Colbeck mm -hmm. and last year's bungling of the aged care COVID response, the deaths of many residents in Commonwealth-run facilities under his watch and his eventual reward by being appointed uh, sports minister. Well, it sounds delightful. Cheers. Uh, well, while Wilma takes her position, we cross live now to um, Maggie and Brian in the commentary box. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Well, uh, as you can see, Wilma's straight into it as the spirit representing the life force, doing the best she can to escape the then Minister for Aged Care, seen here as the Angel of Death. Yeah, that's right, Maggie. And he's assisted by the wood nymph Frydenberg, swooping in to blame the states and distract everybody by pointing out breaches of hotel quarantine, which, he forgets, is a Commonwealth responsibility as well. And as Richard Colbeck goes from pursuer to pursued, a cure is discovered, which, as newly appointed sports minister, he goes about administering to Olympic athletes ahead of the elderly. Ripper. Back to you, Sean. Wonderful. It's kind of sad. Well, not coming up because you can't ask that is on in a minute. Doping inquiry results in horse being suspended and lack of wages growth no problem in this warehouse. And before we go, I'm not sure if you caught Dan Tien on the weekend. Do check for symptoms. But if you saw him on Insiders, you might have seen this explanation of what the government is going to do for Victorians who don't have COVID but are unable to work because of the lockdown. You should um, go to Centrelink and see whether you might be eligible for an emergency pass. Are you eligible you, you if you don't have COVID? Can, are you announcing a new government policy position no, here that you can get the payment? A, this is, this is not a, a new government policy. This so you is can't not get a... the payment if you don't have COVID? So hopefully that's clear. If you don't have COVID but are unable to do your job because of the lockdown, go to Centrelink, which you also can't do because of the lockdown, and ask for assistance that you aren't eligible for. It's not all that bad news, though, because if you can't do your job because you don't have a clue what you're talking about, you might be eligible to be the Trade Minister. Goodbye. Giant baby.